Hello again, Irish fans, and welcome to a new season of the Jack Swarbrick Show. On this week's show, Jack will talk with Yahoo Sports national correspondent Pat Forty and the man who is in charge of the video you will see on the new video board here at Notre Dame Stadium, Fighting Irish Media, executive producer for live events, Michael Bonner. But first, we're going to meet this fall's student co-host, Sam Bush, a four-year offensive lineman on the Notre Dame football team, a proud member of Wapu Nation. We'll talk about that. And it seems to be very appropriate that this whole show was recorded inside Notre Dame Stadium. And we begin right now, Jack. We're here in the South Club at Notre Dame Stadium. I know you're very proud of this entire project and this space, among others. We certainly are, and we'll talk a little bit more about this space as, as we get going here. I couldn't be more proud of it. But uh, I do want to start by talking to my, introducing my co-host a little bit. You know, we started uh, the concept of having student co-host with a, uh, with a walk-on from Modern Day High School. And I thought to myself, we got to find a walk-on from Modern Day who's more talented than that. <laughs> And so we've done it. Um, of course, it wasn't hard. Schmidt set a low bar, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, he, you know he did gonna, okay for himself. We're going to hear from him, right? You yeah, know, exactly. you know, you know he's, he's probably going to text me after I get done finishing this. As thing soon up. as this goes up, we're going <laughs> to we're going to hear from Joe. Um, but no, you uh, you you're uh, Newport Beach, is that right? That's correct. And then uh, modern day. Yeah. So actually, I uh, I started off at a smaller public high school, uh, Newport Harbor. Um, but after my sophomore year, I decided that uh, it was in my best interest to play for Coach Bruce Rollinson at Modern Day, and uh, it's been my dream my whole life to play Notre Dame, play, play Notre Dame football, excuse me. And I saw that was the best way it was going to get done. So, put two and two together and haven't looked back since. And tell us a little bit about that experience, about that journey. How's it been for you? You're a senior now. I'm a senior now. Uh, you know, it's obviously had its ups and downs, but I mean. Every day I get to wake up on the Notre Dame campus is unbelievable. And that sounds cliche, you know, what what you may say about it. But there's something special about this place. And I realized that ever since I was a little kid. I have probably close to a dozen members of my family who are either graduates or current alumni of that school in Southern California that uh, wears the yellow and red. I'm not even going to acknowledge who it is. <laughs> but um, – I grew up, I was like, ah, I don't want that. So kind of thought, what's the exact opposite of that? And led me to a small school in South Bend, Indiana, Notre Dame. And I've felt, been in love with it ever since. Well, we're, we're awfully lucky you have. Now, uh, you remember the Wahoo, Wapu Nation? Uh, El right? Prez, El Presidente. Uh, Shout re- out to rec- my boys. Recently elected El Presidente, right? Elected? I, I don't know if it's so much an election. <laughs> it's more of a passing of the torch. Uh, the guy before me, uh, someone you're familiar with, Jesse Bon Jovi, uh, went by the king. Before him, we had uh, Connor Cavallera, so I'm honored to be able to carry on that line of Wapu leaders. It is it, it is an important an important. Uh, line of leadership. Now you lost one of your members a couple of weeks ago, right? We got, you got, he, 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 you trade him for a draft pick, or what did you do? You know, uh, we. It, it hurts losing a member of Wapu every every time it happens. I remember when Fink left, I was crushed. I didn't come out of my room for a week. <laughs> um, but no, in all seriousness, Austin Webster is the definition of Notre Dame football. I mean, he's the first walk-on captain elected in the history of this school, which just saying that says something, you know, Joe couldn't get that done, but Austin got it done. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know that there's a more deserving member of the Wapu Nation than Austin Webster to be put on scholarship and have his dream realized in that fashion. And I can't think of a guy on the team that isn't just as excited for him as I am. Our coach, uh, when we were down at Culver – said to me that the team had had um, the single best team bonding moment he can remember since a moment when we were at the Music City Bowl, and it was you playing <laughs> guitar and singing for the team. Um, where does all that talent come from? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't really know. I've, just, uh, I've always kind of been the artistic kid in my family, uh, I guess you could say. I've... I always had a huge fascination in film, film major here, but music's had a really close, close uh, place in my heart. And I've been playing guitar since junior, senior year of high school. 
And it's actually not until very recently that I've become comfortable singing in front of people the way that I do. And I just decided, you know what, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go so big that nobody can make fun of me for it. And everybody seemed to really, you know, take on to it positively and really respond to it. And we were sitting out at dinner one night. There was a guy up on stage with a guitar doing his little set. And I think I was sitting with, like, Greer Martini, Tyler Newsom, and Andrew Trimbetti. And they all said, hey, you should, uh, you should get up there and play, play a song. And so I go, you know, ask the guy, hey, would it be all right if I, you know, kind of played a song in your guitar? I swear to God, like, I'm not a poser. I can <laughs> relatively hold my own with the six-stringed instrument. And um, I got up there. I was a little shaky, a little nervous. But they let me do two songs. I did two Eagles songs. Uh, started off with Take It Easy and uh, finished it off with Hotel California. And it was a great time, you know, everybody give me high fives after, but it, it, that's not what it was ever meant for. And the fact that it became one of those big team bonding experiences, that, that means so much to me because any part that I can have in bringing this team together, making us better in any way, you know, as we mentioned earlier, member of the walk-on nation, don't see a lot of playing time, but um, anything I can do is uh, I, I'm more than happy to do it. Did uh, did Hotel California include the Joe Walsh solo guitar? No, solo? no. But actually, I was about to finish the song, and the guy who lent me his guitar comes up and taps me on the shoulder, and he goes, "Hey, keep going, keep going." So I go on for another verse, and he grabs the mic and pulls out a harmonica and breaks off into a little harmonica solo. And I just kind of look at the guy. I'm like, "Yo, we should we should do this more often, man. <laughs> We're, we sound pretty good together." If I'm not gonna, if I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> And and it's a it's a great deal for him because your eligibility screwed up if you get paid so he can take exactly, all the money. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a win win scenario. <laughs> well, that uh, you you said I think you, you captured in your comments there something that I see demonstrated in this team at this point as much as any team I've been associated with here, and that people want to do whatever they have to do. They're 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 willing to do whatever yeah. it is to help make this team successful. Do you sense as big a culture shift year over year as I do? More so, I mean, this this year has been turned on its head. You yeah. know, bringing in Coach Bayless has been just exponentially beneficial to us. Um, but in my four years here, uh, especially being a member of the scout offense, we call ourselves the swag team, which has eventually evolved into the gang, um, Coach Kelly preaches knowing your role and accepting your role. And that's something that I've really tried to take to heart because I realize, you know, I'm, I'm not going to start over Quentin Nelson. I'm not going to start over a guy like Mike McGlinchey. Sam Mustafer, who's been my roommate for two years now, great guy. I could probably beat him in an arm wrestling match or something like that, but I'm not going to beat him on the football field. Um, so just knowing, okay, my, my spot may not be helping the team out on the field on Saturdays, but – there's five days before that that we still have to go out and practice and, you know, give it our all and sweat and just grind. You know, we had gritty Wednesday today, and it's all about grinding and just knowing your role in days like that and being like, okay, what can I do to get my team better so they can play on Saturdays? That has remained a constant. And obviously, you know, with, like I said, the introduction of Coach Bayless, that might be felt a little bit more, but that's never, that's never gone away in my four years here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you mentioned helping the the other guys get better. One of the things you guys regularly do at the end of practice, you you lose the helmets, but you do a series of drills. Oh yeah, um, pass protection drills, oh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, you make that as physical as anybody who who's who's replicating the defensive <laughs> lineman, right? I mean, you do a great job of having your motor motor go full speed. I saw you making Liam better today. You know, uh, it, that just all goes back to knowing your role. And I, I get I get a lot of pride when I see Q, when I see Liam, when I see Mike, when I see Sam and all those guys go out on the field on Saturday and succeed. Because I know, okay, like, hey, I, I had a part in this. It may not be seen on Saturday. It may not get in the paper tomorrow. It may not be on Sports Center on Monday. But I had a huge part in helping them have the success that they're out there doing right now. Well, you clearly do, and you're and and the leadership you're providing 
uh, is having a big impact on the team as well. The contributions you're going to make to this show may be even bigger, however. Um, it, it, it's really a coin toss, you know, <laughs> six one way, half dozen the other. Who, who, who knows? Um, we will have you joined as the year goes on by some other students uh, awesome. who, will, who will join us and, and help us round out our hosting crew. But I can't tell you how happy I am that you agreed to do this and that you're helping us get the year started I'm on, the, on a great note. I'm honored. See you That's next true. week. Can't wait. Thank All right. You. Thank we'll you. be back in a minute. We've been at this process since January. We're in a different place than we were. They've had a tough summer. It's been difficult. They've done a great job. Anything that's really good is, is, is difficult. Welcome back to the Jack Swarbrick Show. Um, this is a very special segment. It is the uh, first segment we've done at the stadium since it's been renovated. This may be the first media segment done at the stadium since it's been renovated. And so it makes a lot of sense that we'd uh, inaugurate this with one of the leading members of the media in this country, a good friend um, uh, from Yahoo, Pat Forty. Pat? Thanks for being with us. Jack, it's an honor. It's a thrill. Be down here on Joe Montana's field at the 50-yard <laughs> line. This is great. Uh, we are indeed on the 50-yard line uh, of, of the stadium, and uh, pretty exciting to see all the changes that have uh, that have occurred around here. Um, we're headed into a new season. Uh, you have a global perspective on that. What are the storylines that we'll see in the upcoming football season? You know, I, I think it's a really – fascinating year for quarterbacks around the country if you look there's uh really some star power uh in los angeles you have josh rosen from ucla sam darnold from usc who obviously notre dame will will play um you've got lamar jackson the returning heisman trophy winner who some people aren't even in putting in the heisman mix because there's so many other guys uh, baker mayfield who was a heisman finalist at oklahoma jt barrett at ohio state and a lot of guys that are going to have decisions on whether they're going to go to the NFL after this season at that position. So you are really anxious to watch them play and then watch them decide whether they're staying in college or they're going to the, going to the pros. Do you see that in part as sort of an evolution of the, the, the level of preparedness the young quarterbacks, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're in so many camps and they've got their throwing teacher and they sort, of, they sort of get to college with a level of refinement that we probably haven't seen in before. I think that's very true. Uh, I was at the Manning Passing Academy in June and talked to Archie Manning about that there and he said it's just amazing how much more advanced players are at that position at a younger age. Uh, they you know they can make throws better throws they can read defenses better they've they've just been through a lot more quarterback coaching and refinement I guess uh, leading up to that although he did point out we said we still get a lot of guys who can't take a snap from center because <laughs> of the advent of the spread and the shotgun so that's right. something they work on at that camp. I'll bet. A um, lot of talk last year, which we were happy to encourage, that the ACC had sort of emerged um, as the strongest conference in college football, and obviously a lot of great evidence in their overall bowl game performance and it's the national championship, obviously. What's your take on the strength of the conferences heading into this year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the ACC, uh, coming off probably its best year it ever has, they, they have the the national champion. They had the Heisman winner. Florida State won the Orange Bowl. Um, as you said, overall, just it was a very, very good year for the league. And I look for them to, ha to have another really good year. I mean, Florida State's going to start the season in the top three. Clemson's going to be top five, six, seven most places. Louisville will be ranked. Uh, Miami could be back uh, as a national power. Virginia Tech is on, uh, on its way back up as well. Uh, so I think the ACC is going to be really good. I think if you look around, you try to hash it out. I still think depth in the SEC is uh, is very strong, but it's Alabama has made everybody else look bad because yeah. they've been so good. Uh, the Big Ten East has been very good and is going to be really good again. I think Ohio State and Penn State there, uh, Wisconsin probably in the West. I think Northwestern's a bit of a sneaky team there. Out in the Pac-12, th I'm not sure, you know, if, if, if USC can 
can take the steps forward the, the, the way they played at the end of last year. If they can carry that over, they could be a national championship contender. Washington will be good again. Um, Big 12 turnover there, the yeah. transition. We've got new coaches at Oklahoma and Texas and not sure what to expect from them. So you know, I'd probably start the pecking order with the SEC, but uh, I, I don't think it's like a dominant number one over everybody else. You know, one of the one of the things we've seen in recent years, I think a byproduct of the CFP, is a lot of really marquee early season games. Um, we're opening the early weeks with with several of those. What ones do you think are going to be the most significant? Yeah, it's it's been great. I think for fans to be able to get really good games right out of the box. Uh, so Labor Day weekends become really good for college football. Um, I will be at uh, Alabama and Florida State, which is as good an opener as I can remember. Number one against number three, and both teams look really good. Uh, also, Florida plays Michigan in Arlington, Texas. Uh, on that Sunday, UCLA and Texas A&M play in Los Angeles. Uh, on Monday, we have uh, Tennessee and Georgia Tech. Um, so there's, a, there's a lot of really good matchups. And I, I kind of hate taking the games off campus because the vibe is so fun and special on a campus, but I understand why they're doing it. And if the bottom line means better games, I'm all for it. Yeah, well, it, 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 I, I think it has – sometimes it's hard to find room f for a home and home, but you can find room mm -hmm. for a for, for a one-off that does make those games uh, attractive and, and work a little better. Um, mention the CFP. What, what are your thoughts on it? What impact has it had? I think it's been great. I've, I've enjoyed it. You know, I think four teams is better than two, and you're, you're including more people in the mix. You're, more teams are – they are at least thinking they're, they have a chance at it longer into the season. Uh, I don't think it has cheapened the regular season at all. There was a concern that, you know, a playoff would, would hurt the regular season. I, I think maybe quite the opposite, really. I, th I think that, that it, it has, uh, it, as I said, like increased people's uh, hope that they can be part of that playoff and, and kind of kept their season sustained maybe even a little bit longer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the Tuesday night uh, weekly sh reality TV show with the uh, with the head of the committee, um, but you know, it, it, people have talked about it. People have paid attention to it. So uh, I'm I'm all in favor of it. I, in an ideal world, I'd like to see six teams, but I'm okay with four because it's better than two. And would you pick the six the same way it's picked now? I don't know. That's a good question. You could take the champions of the five big conferences and have one at large or you could do it the way that it's done now I you know I've been okay with the way they have done it I haven't necessarily agreed with every decision but I'm fine with a committee doing it I think you know in general they've gotten largely pretty thoughtful people on it and involved and in, and in, uh, taking the responsibility quite seriously so uh, I'm okay with that or I think you could look at, at skinning it a few different other ways did you take part in one of the media mock I selections? Yeah. What was that experience like? It was good. It was really good. It's, uh, you know, it, I've done it for basketball and I've done it for football. Uh, they're definitely different animals because you're you're concentrating on so many fewer teams in football. Um, you know, there's a lot to think about. And and sometimes, you, you know, you think, in, well, this is, this is going to be easy. And, you know, and then you get in, you start really kind of grinding through resumes of teams and, it gets a little bit more difficult than you think as far as differentiating between them and trying to decide does a good win or count more than a good loss, you know, and that sort of thing, and, and just how to, how many losses matter and, and strength of schedule and trying to, to, to figure out all the variables. It's, uh, it was a good exercise to go through. Who did you play? Who, what character I'm were you? I'm trying to think who I was. <laughs> I might have been Tom Osborne. Okay. Which, having watched Tom Osborne's teams kill Missouri when I was in school there, that was that was a tough sell. But I, I think I pulled it off pretty well. <laughs> uh, you, 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 in your list of quarterbacks, you mentioned Rosen earlier. Uh, really great talent. He made a statement that got a lot of attention recently about the uh, incompatibility of uh, pursuing a, an education and playing elite level football. You wrote a very interesting uh, column uh, right after that. Uh, give us a little insight into your thinking. There. Yeah, I, I said Josh Rosen's right. Um, and that it doesn't mean they're impossible, but to a degree they can be in incompatible. Notre Dame does it as well as about anybody. Notre Dame, Stanford are two of the places where you can go and I think you can try to do it all uh, and have some success at it. But it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do here. It's hard to do there. It's hard to do anywhere, and especially if you're going to take on a really challenging major. And that was kind of the point that I was driving at is a lot of times players will seek the, 
I don't want to say the easy way out because none of it's easy, but but a softer degree uh, so that they can c- can concentrate more on their sport. And, you know, I think that's a shame that it, it comes to that for a lot of people. Uh, you know, I use my son as an example. He was a swimmer at Missouri, and he literally could not take – uh, at least one of the main classes in the journalism major because there was nim- no way you could do that and swim at the same time. So I have some, I guess, some empathy for that that situation. It is awfully hard to do both. So I, I, I kind of get Josh Rosen's point. You're raising members of the Missouri Journalism Mafia now? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> yes, I've gone from a member of it to now a, a father of one. Yeah, we got we got another Mafia member on the loose. If you see any good job postings anywhere, let me know. All right, we'll, we'll do that. Speaking of 40 children... Um, you 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 are now known as the uh, father of one of your children because Brooke is uh, emerged as one of the very best female swimmers in the United States, um, and uh, is that some school out west which has got a pretty good program? Stanford, uh, yep. tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, all three of our kids have swam and big be collegiate swimmers. She's just enrolling at Stanford here next month. Uh, middle son Clayton's at Georgia. Oldest one went to Missouri, and it's been a blast you know it's so fun to to go and watch them compete and you know how hard they work at it you just you want them to have uh, a, a success but you want them to enjoy what they're doing and it's it's been really fun to watch brooke is uh, she's in taipei as we speak uh, swimming for the united states in the world university games and uh, she will be enrolling at stanford in uh, in september and uh, be teammates with katie ledecky and simone manuel and who knows how many other Olympians before they're all done? Practicing with Katie probably uh, <laughs> probably is a good workout. You better be ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to you and the success of all, all three children. Um, you married a great gene pool, clearly. <laughs> yes. Um, and so congratulations for that. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and I'd like to talk about um, the, the tumult in your world, uh, how much uh, – media generally and sports media in particular has changed. We'll be back in a minute. The Notre Dame volleyball team defeated New Mexico State to win the Golden Dome Invitational. Here are your highlights from tonight's victory over the Aggies. After losing the first set, the Fighting Irish jumped out to an early 11-7 lead in the second set. The block party continued for Sam Fry, who led the match with eight blocks, followed by Meg Morningstar with five, and Sydney Kuhn with four blocks. Sophomore Gemma Yaden went on a roll late in the match, and with 20 kills and 20.5 points, she led the Irish to a 3-1 victory over the Aggies. For Fighting Irish Media, I'm Tamara Brown. All right, we are back on the 50-yard line at at the stadium with our very special guest, Pat Forty, helping us kick off uh, the show this year. Uh, Spent the first segment talking a lot about uh, college athletics. Uh, My my field. Now I want to switch over to yours, if it's okay with you. We we have seen more change in the sports media business in the past eight months than probably in the previous 80 years. Um, what's your take on what's going on? Yeah, tumultuous. Uh, it's been amazing. The, the pace of change uh, has been pretty incredible, a little bit scary. Uh, a lot of people that I know and really like and they're very talented in this profession lost their jobs uh, at ESPN, at Sports Illustrated, at Yahoo Sports, uh, at Fox Sports. And so, you know, it's it's I think everybody's kind of trying to, you know, it's like a boxer who's got their mouthpiece knocked out. You know, you're trying to pick it back up and put it back in and figure out exactly what the heck's going on here. Uh, I think there's there's begun to be a little bit of an industry rally, so to speak. Uh, there's these new websites called The Athletic uh, that are starting that are going to be subscription-based. Uh, there's going to be college football, college basketball, and then they're doing some city sites. And if, if those work, I think that could might be kind of the, the next shift in this, where you see people going away from advertising and towards subscription models, and you see maybe some of the actual city-centric sites. Uh, so, you know, I think... Nobody really knows what's going to be next, though. I mean, the pace of change has just been incredible over the last decade. I mean, if you think of what, you know, we, smartphones were just barely around a, a decade ago. The Twitter didn't exist a decade ago. And now, you know, you, you can't go, you, you couldn't even think of living without those things. So I don't know what it's going to be like in five years or ten years, uh, but I, I hope there is still a, a healthy, uh, vibrant uh, sports media out there. How is what you do now different? Um, it's, it's changed in terms of, uh, we are so attuned to traffic numbers and what people read, cause we can get all the feedback now on that, all the analytics. And so people, 
you know, are, are constantly crunching numbers on, you know, what is being read, what's not being read. And it's good to know those things because to a degree we might have been deluding ourselves before about what fans were actually interested in. Um, the immediacy is both good and bad because it's great to be able to get information out quickly, but you better be right. You know, fortunately, there is still a premium, certainly at Yahoo Sports and, and other places, on being right as opposed to being first. Um, so, you know, that, but there is a, there's a lot of competitive pressure to be fast with things. Um, it, it's a much more uh, visual, I guess, medium now. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot more video involved and a lot less, uh, you know, of, of doing what what we did in your office earlier today, me interviewing you and sitting there and I actually took notes by hand. I wasn't recording that sort of thing. It was pretty old school interview. Uh, and I, I kind of miss some of the elements of that, but it's, it's definitely a different, uh, different world. Yeah. Um, one of the fundamental differences, it seems to me, is there's no, there's no impediment to distribution, right? I mean, anybody can join the marketplace. Um, and, and as a result, um, some of that marketplace is taken by people who have no journalism background, no professional training, um, and are approaching the job in a very different way. Yep. Do you think the average fan is able to distinguish? Some, some, but the average fan maybe not. Um, and I do. I, I, I agree. That's that's a definite change, and it can be troubling because you uh, and I would imagine that uh, your media relations staff has to deal with a lot of people they don't know and haven't heard of trying to get credentials right. um, to cover Notre Dame football, Notre Dame basketball, whatever the case may be. Uh, there is, I think there is, I think you can accurately say there's a decline in professional standards. Uh, and that's not a good thing. It, it, you know, change is fine as long as it's good change, but that part of the job has changed and probably not for the best. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I do think it, 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 there's that dynamic. And as you indicated before, uh, there's sort of a, an absence of deliberation now. Right. Because you're going to yes, you're going to put it up immediately and you're going to comment on it immediately. And you probably got a pretty small percentage of the information that would normally inform inform some of that. Absolutely. No. Yeah, you're right. The, 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 the rush to a, to be a, to be fast does lead to, you know, much less thoroughly reported stories and much less thinking, you know, about yeah. what am I going to say and how am I going to say it and what's the responsible, full, fair, accurate way to do that. The flip side of uh, the, the, the much more open distribution mechanisms is um, there's more room for other sports and, and people who have an interest in it. And you certainly are one of the leading people in covering Olympic sports. Um, how do you balance your focus and time? Yeah, I mean, I love the Olympics. Obviously, you, you're well versed. I think is, are wonderful events. They're amazing to see the, that many cultures come together and societies come together. Um, you know, walking through an Olympic village is unlike anything else you're going to do in, in the sports world. I think uh, so. I mean, I, I'm happy to cover those sports whenever I get the chance. Um, you know, one of the things you do find out when you have analytics and numbers is that not nearly as many people read about swimming as they do about college football. So uh, my focus and energies tend to be more towards football and basketball. But when I get the chance to, to do those things, uh, I greatly enjoy it. And, and it is interesting, that specifically to swimming, that, that you have a Katie Ledecky who has a huge audience out there now. And that Michael Phelps had an immense audience. I wrote, I'll tell you this, uh, from Rio a story on Phelps' first gold medal from there on the on the 400 freestyle relay got 11 million clicks on that thing. Wow. And so the Phelps audience and the Olympic audience is real. And, you know, you, if you can capture if, if it's a star-driven sport, so if there are those people out there and if, if Usain Bolt in track and that sort of thing, uh, there is an audience for them. It's just the, the mainstream may not be quite as big. Yeah, it, it, that's an interesting take, and it also sort of plays into the uh, the age of celebrity that we're in. We're absolutely we're doing this on the eve of a prize fight that's a little unlike <laughs> unlike anything I've ever seen before in terms of the uh, promotional buildup and the interest uh, for a guy who's never boxed before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is like it reminds me way back when Muhammad Ali fought a uh, a wrestler. You know, from Japan, I believe it was, and and the, the whole thing was just bizarre. It was awful television. Yeah. Uh, but and this hopefully will be a little bit better television. But yes, it's become more spectacle than anything else. Yeah. 
Jesse Owens racing a thoroughbred yeah. at some point was, <laughs> yeah. was, was, I think, along the lines of those things. Uh, journalism has played a big role in covering another aspect of college sports, which has uh, probably been a lot more prevalent than we would have liked, which is the, the ongoing challenges with compliance and NCAA issues. You've had some of that in your home state, mm-hmm. um, but it's certainly not limited there. It's, it's, yep. it's been, around, been around the country. What's your take on the state of all that today? You know, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't think college sports is as quote unquote dirty as some people like to just portray it. I think basketball has a real, real image problem. Um, and just because of the, the way players come up through the system, it, it is not necessarily a high school based system. There's a lot of third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties involved who have nothing to do with education. Uh, and I, so I think there's a setup there. Also the outsized importance of a single player to a program. Um, that, that's, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a very good setup. So th- there's an image problem there. Um, football, there's, you know, there's more seven on seven camps and teams and stuff like that now. So you get more people involved and are they all Simon pure? Probably not. Uh, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's very interesting to see, you know, how well the NCAA can do as far as policing. Uh, you know, I think some efforts have been good. I think the, the current regime in there now in enforcement is pretty good. Um, the North Carolina case, which is ongoing with academics, is going to be intently watched when that ruling comes out. The Louisville case was a significant case, and I thought a significant penalty that needed to be if you want penalties to be deterrence. Uh, the Mississippi case, which is uh, coming up for a committee on infractions hearing uh, next month. Uh, so there's a lot going on right now, and then we'll see what happens with Baylor if that even ends up being in the NCAA purview. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm a believer in college athletics. I think it is a very good thing in general. I hate to see it being just kind of sometimes tarred as this this dirty enterprise, but it, it needs to, to, to own up to what it doesn't do well and, and try to clean up those things at, at places where, it, where things are going on. Yeah, you know, another dynamic that we've seen play out, I, I think in this past year, uh, significantly that we'd had before, but not to this magnitude, is the transfer dynamic in college yeah. athletics. Over 700 Division One college basketball players changed institutions since last basketball season. I'm all for student freedom to go mm-hmm. wherever they want, mm-hmm. um, and I'm, we're generally here opposed to any sort of limitations on that. But you'd like it done for the right reasons, and and uh, some of the dynamics you suggested, uh, influencers who don't really mm-hmm. have uh, any academic interest at, at heart, or tend to get involved in that increasingly today. Yep. Do you see that yep. continuing? I do, um, and I'm not sure. I don't know how to resolve this because I I, yeah, I feel very strongly that a player, especially if you have graduated, you should be able to go wherever you want. And play. Yep. You know, if you've done the, if you've accomplished what everybody says is the goal when they go to college, just to graduate and get that degree, I don't like people that uh, put restrictions on that. But at the same time, I mean, 700 transfers is an alarming number, and there are, you know, I think the the graduate transfer rule certainly has been abused because a lot of guys have no intention of getting a graduate degree, uh, and so I'm not sure, you know, I'm sh- I think there people are looking for mechanisms wherein they can safeguard that, you know, that whether it's if they don't get that graduate degree or don't attend classes for more than a semester, you get docked a scholarship or something, whatever that case may be. Uh, there's probably ways to tighten that loophole. Uh, it, it is difficult, and I just I do think the just the transient nature of basketball. I mean, a lot of these kids are going to two, three high schools, and so they get to college. It's the same thing. I'll just if I don't like it here, I'll just go there, and, and I don't think that's good for the sport. Well, I'd I'd lose I'd lose my uh, once a week journalism card if I didn't if I didn't close this segment by uh, asking first of all, college football champion, Notre Dame, of course. Uh, no, um, let's go with uh, I'm going to say Ohio State. I, I think that they're ready for a big year. Their defense should be lights out. I think J T. Barrett gets back to playing better quarterback under the new offensive coordinator there and I think Ohio State uh, I'll take Ohio State over Alabama Heisman Trophy winner 
Uh, Sam Darnold. I'm going to go with him at least until Notre Dame shuts him down. You know, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I just, I, I love the kids' playing style. A lot of moxie, a lot of freelance improvisation. Uh, and I was awfully impressed with him last year. So if that carries over, look out. And because I can't count on getting you back in time, NCAA men's basketball champion. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. I have not looked that far ahead very much. I'm going to say, like, Michigan State. I think the, with Miles Bridges not going to the NBA and a good another good recruiting class coming in, I think they're due to, to not just get to the Final Four but take one down. Pat, it's been a pleasure. I can't thank you My enough for, for visiting with us and getting, getting our year started off the right way. Awesome. Thanks for having me. We'll be back in a minute. Notre Dame hosted Ball State on Sunday afternoon, and here are the highlights. After a scoreless first half, Natalie Jacobs was able to find the back of the net, giving the Irish their first goal of the season, and they were far from finished. Just a few minutes later, Jennifer Westendorf was able to sneak behind the Ball State defense and hammer home this volley. She stuck it in the top right corner to give the Irish a 2-0 lead. Just a few minutes after that, freshman Eva Herm was able to weave her way through three Ball State defenders. She got it off to Westendorf, and then Sandra Yu was able to clean it up for the goal. And finally, in the last minute of the game, with her first career goal, it was Katie Euler off this wacky rebound. She puts it in, and the Irish would go on to win this one by a final of 4 to nothing. Welcome back. Uh, we are on the uh, field at the stadium, and uh, we're taking full advantage of this location because they may not let me back on here once the season starts. And uh, I love the set because it, it has this uh, oversized uh, image of the, the show logo. And the reason it's up there is because of the guy sitting next to me. He is, uh, he is the master of all this. If you don't like what you see on the video board, we'll give you, we'll, before you leave, we'll give you his cell number. You can make a call during the game. But uh, Mike Bonner, welcome to the show and welcome to Notre Dame. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate me having me. And um, I don't know that I call it oversized. It feels just about right. Over My there. logo was oversized. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Not the, not the board. It's perfect. <laughs> How long have you been preparing for Temple? So uh, I got here um, September of 2016. Um, and really from the day I got here, uh, I started taking notes uh, I attended a few games as a fan. I sat in the stands, and of course, a play would happen, and as any fan would do, I'd crank my head to the left to look at the replay, and oh yeah, it wasn't there. Uh, so I have been preparing for some time, um, kind of catching the nuances, looking at the traditions, and, and making sure that, you know, I not changing any of that, and just seeing what we can improve, see how we visually enhance what we're doing here, um, and just make it great. That, by the way, is one of my very favorite moments at every game when there's a controversial play, watching the opposing coach trying to find a video board to look at it. It's, it's, a, it's the reaction you can always count on. How does one get into this business? Where, what was your journey that, that made you somebody who's one of the world's best at this? Well, it, it has been an interesting journey. Um, I started out in local news at WNBC-TV in New York. I worked for Lynn Berman, who still is on the Today Show doing Spanning the World. Uh, so I started out in local news um, covering New York teams. So I covered the Knicks and the Rangers and the Mets and the Yankees and then uh, the Islanders and the, Ra and, and the Devils and, you know, every team there. And in doing so, I got to know the media relations folks at, at the different um, teams. And in 1999, there was a job that was open with the New York Yankees as the assistant manager of video production and uh, PR director by the name of Rick Cerrone, not the catcher, uh, another Rick Cerrone, um, said, hey, you know, this might be a good job for you. And I, in local news, you know, had spent time in the control room and, and was comfortable with, with that whole situation. And, you know, back in the day when I was going in school, I, I didn't think that you could work for a team and do something like this. And I started with the Yankees in 99, and I was there until 2013, uh, having done the Shamrock Series game, and it wasn't even the Shamrock Series then, in 2010 with uh, Notre Dame and Army. And uh, then I got to go to football, and I worked for the Denver Broncos from 2013 to 2016. 
but uh, you know, I, I caught that Notre Dame bug in 2010 when I was here, um, and I thought this was a really special place, and I really could see myself and my family here. So I had stayed in touch with, with all sorts of folks, and I made sure they knew when I was in football. Like, you know, that baseball guy that, you know, you're, you're talking about helping out with the video board? I'm in football now, you know. Um, and as fate would have it and timing, it all worked out, and, and we're here in South Bend. How is getting the video elements of this place going different from operating at a venue who's had them for a long time? Yeah, you, you really, you're starting from scratch. It sounds cliche, but it is an empty canvas, and you have to fill it up. Um, so it, it's things like explaining to folks who have never had this, had a video board like this before, how we go about doing on-field presentations. And it's, you know, we're going to tell your story, and we're going to tell your story by, uh, you know, putting video or photos in before we come out to the money shot of, of you know, whoever the person is that we're, honoring on the field. Um, it's making sure that people understand that there's a rhyme or a reason why we do things situationally, you know. So in the past where they said, oh, well, you know, that presentation was always first time out, uh, the first quarter, no matter what. And I, and I, you know, had to educate a little bit and say, well, we let the play on the field dictate that, you know. You don't want to you know, bring the fans down. If they're going crazy after a great score, you ride that momentum. So it's things like that. But but I really have enjoyed it um, in, in doing that, in that I've gotten to meet a lot of really great people here at the university, both in athletics and, and uh, on the academic side. Uh, so it, it's all that preparation. And, and it's the making sure you fit everything in that you need to fit in. Uh, and that at the end of the day, you know, we're uh, helping the team uh, get some W's. You got the kiss cam all figured out? No, sir. No, sir. Um, you know, <laughs> My I, boss I, just had a heart attack <laughs> with me asking that question. I, um, you know, I've worked for some classic brands, and I can honestly say I've never done a kiss cam before, and I'm, and I'm happy that continuing in my career here that we won't be doing one here either. Speaking of cams, uh, you, you have a boatload of images to pick from when you're doing this. Uh, how many cameras? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to you and Father John. Um, we have nine manned cameras. Uh, so with that, we have um, two up high uh, that have some very long lenses, broadcast lenses. We have uh, two end zone cameras. We have uh, two handheld cameras. We have a slash camera that uh, cuts across the field and gets a great shot of the bench, uh, hero shots. Um, and then we have two RF cameras that they'll spend a significant amount of time in the student section and with the band uh, and being able to, uh, you know, get all sorts of different shots on the field. Um, we also have robotic cameras, so there's a camera above the video board, there's a camera in the uh, tunnel, there's a camera outside of the tunnel, there's a camera that we call our board confidence camera that allows us to, uh, you know, watch the game film after. Uh, we have a camera in the press conference room that we feed everyone. Uh, so, yeah, we're certainly not lacking for cameras here. And and I was with you a little bit for the the, the practice we held when uh, we had the public opening in the facility. Um, I got a headache just listening. Um, you're calling the show live, right? You're making all those decisions on the fly. Uh, do, do you build a logic tree in advance? Do you, do you sort of have a concept going in of how you're going to do that? Sure. And I I definitely do not do it alone. I have some great people in the control room. It's, it's an interesting setup where I'm on the ninth floor overseeing the field, and I have a staff that's in the control room, and then you have staff that are on cameras out here. Uh, so we are all spread out, but we're able to communicate uh, via headset. Um, you do create a rundown, and it gives you a guide. It gives everyone an idea of, okay, this is what's coming next. But it is simply a guide because that can be turned on its side at any time based on what happens on the field. So yeah, we do go in with a plan um, and then you kind of have stuff that you put up your sleeve. You know, you have stuff that situationally, this is the time to run that pump up video. This is what's going to get the fans and the team fired up. So you have those two, those, those aces in the hole, if you would. Uh, what's, what's the approach to building the content the sort of feature content in advance. How do you how do you plan that out? So 
there's there's a mix of things that that you want to make sure that you cover uh, at a, at a school like this and an institution like this. You have to honor the traditions and the history of of, of Notre Dame. So that's a big part of it. Uh, you also have to take care of of the the football team that's on the field. You know, you have to you know play music that they're wa- gonna want to hear. Maybe someone my age, maybe it's not exactly our style, but there are times where this is for the players. There are times that this is for the fans. Um, you know, we also want to make sure that we're educating about the university, about the things that we've done here. So if it's interesting ways in which we're announcing the mass schedule or uh, an interesting way in which we're telling about the sustainability things that we've done here at the stadium, um, it's always making sure that there's something entertaining to go along with it. It's not just a you know, plain old read. How frustrating is it when you're in the in the midst of the show and things are moving quickly and the AD walks into the box and says, you're not running that segment you're about to run? You know, um, <laughs> it's part of the job, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, you, you, you just have to... You got to roll with the punches. You really do. Well, I mean, you ro- you rolled with it very good oh, oh, during oh. our first test when I uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, I I didn't intend to, to to lay that test on you, but uh, you you handled it well. It, you, like I said, you always have that ace in the hole. You always have that backup that you go to just in case something's not going to work out. And and the thing in, in whether it's in live television, live broadcast, live scoreboard production, um, y- you always make sure that there's redundancy there. You always make sure that, that you have something else to go to. You never back yourself up in the corner where it's a, oh, gosh, what am I going to do now? And you try to keep your cool no matter what because mistakes are going to happen, things are going to happen, but the game's going to keep going. So no no need to dwell on those things. You just move on and you say, okay, you know, how do we attack this You know, another way next time we encounter such an issue? One last question before we let you go. What will our policy be relative to the controversial call? So I, I've actually met with Coach Kelly on this. And he, his take is you show it and you show it again. And after that, point's been made. Don't keep rolling back the footage, you know, pushing in, doing, doing all sorts of crazy things that are going to show the referee up. You make sure that the fan sees what has happened. You give them that opportunity to make sure that the coaching staff and the referee see what happened, um, but you don't overdo it so that, you know, later in the game, yeah. you've you've really alienated yourself against that referee and you're not going to get that call. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great approach. Um, glad that's how we're doing it. Glad you're here to uh, get us through what will be one of the most uh, – interesting challenges in the history of this stadium, bringing video to life and uh, making sure it contributes to the environment uh, in ways that are consistent with this university and help our football team win. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. I am humbled and honored to to be here and, uh, you know, to be a part of history. Uh, it's, It's really spectacular. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We'll be back for our final segment. Attention to detail. Welcome back to the Jack Swarbrick Show. As we told you at the top of the show, this entire show was recorded and shot inside Notre Dame Stadium as the Crossroads Project comes to conclusion. There's still a lot of academic space work still being done, but the football parts of it, football-related parts of it are done. And I know you're enormously proud of how this gigantic project is coming together. Yeah, it's hard to tell you how proud I am. I mean, you envision it at the front end, and you hope it will be what you want. And everything about this has exceeded my expectations. 
applications. Everybody at this university who played a role in bringing this to life captured the essence of what we were trying to do. The concourses are so much more historic now. The, the field viewing experience is going to be so much better for the fans. And we've got such great hospitality space. And this is a classic example of that. I, I, I hope our fans will get an opportunity to come into this area. It'll have a game day function, but we'll have other events here. I think this may be the most special sports space, uh, non-competition sports space uh, that we have on campus. It celebrates the history of Notre Dame football, the the art and architecture of it capture the time and the history. Uh, it's everything we wanted it to be as a gathering place for people who care about Notre Dame football. And you cared so much about the history and the essence of the football program. And you mentioned you had a function for the athletic department here uh earlier this week and you mentioned how when they put the upper bowl on they kind of lost it they just poured concrete and the history was lost but now i mean again i walked through it tonight the history is back oh it is bricking the columns adding the period lighting in the concourse adding all of the historical signage uh it it feels like we recaptured the rockney bowl um and you know, I I was I was focused on preserving the Rockney Bowl. I actually think we recaptured it, and it it, it you now don't feel a difference when you walk between those two spaces, and you feel like you're immersed in Notre Dame history. Big part of that in this space for me is the is the bar area in this facility, which is Harper's, named after mm-hmm. Jesse Harper, the guy who who provided the guidepost for how I try and do my job as the athletic director here. And the football aspect of this project that's going to be most noticed, of course, is the video board. You interviewed Michael Bonner, who's really going to be the guy running it on game days. But I know so much work's gone into it, somewhat controversial for some, but you've worked so hard not to let any advertising. I mean, I've seen the meetings where, well, we can't mention that because it'll look like advertising in the replays. The experience is just going to be so much better. Yeah, it's going to celebrate Notre Dame. It's not, it's not about commercialism. It's about celebrating the university, and it's about helping you – consume the game better uh, and enjoy the game more Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned Mike Uh, I have every confidence he'll do a great job but just in case he doesn't we'll post his cell phone uh, and his email address and make sure make sure everybody can get a hold of him okay well we always want to have customer service and of course as you know it was your idea we'll be doing uh, a little post-game show in here that'll be fed to the premium spaces and we think other platforms that we are still talking about bring in former player Ryan Harris I'm really looking forward to that Oh, I, I love the concept. I mean, I want to I want to continue the experience when the game's over, right? And, and 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 it's a great time to reflect on the game, talk to talk to people, especially those who are visiting us. Boy, we have a sideline full of former players this weekend because it's that week in the NFL where not much happens in this preseason week, and they can get a little time off, and and a lot of them are coming to see them. So it's opportunities like that to. To, to bring our, our great program friends in here after the game and see what they're up to and talk a little football. Jack, thanks. We're out of time. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Go Irish.